and welcome back to the Climate Change Roundtable. I am your usual host who wasn't here the previous two weeks, Andy Singer. And joining me today is Anthony Watts, Linnea Lucan, and Sterling Burnett. How's everyone doing? Good doing. Doing well. Yeah, doing. Yeah, you know what? The joke I was going to make was probably too offensive to do it live on a, a podcast. <laughs> I'm going to just move on and, and share that one after we're done recording. But uh, so, yeah, so obviously, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was kind of good. So, um, Obviously, last week we talked about oil and gas prices, and by we, you all. Um, this week, and I believe, I can't remember if it was Sterling or Anthony who proposed this to me, but we should talk about uh, a food crisis or food shortages that are going on across the world and how like many Democrats and liberals are tying it towards um, the Ukraine-Russia conflict, while maybe we have a different point of view. So let's jump right into it with essentially, and this question's for you, Anthony. The corporate media often reports that humanity is like nearing a food crisis or even in one. These claims include that the global crop supply will plummet while prices will increase across the board. Is there any truth to this narrative? So far, I haven't seen any. Um, you know, it's a lot like they keep reporting that uh, California is going to fall into the ocean over the next earthquake. They yeah. keep repeating these things and saying that, yes, there's this food crisis on the horizon. And but they have not materialized yet, just like many other predictions they've made about sea level and climate refugees and so forth, all of which you can learn about if you visit our website, climateataglance.com. We cover all of these topics. But here's the thing. Right now, there may, in fact, be a looming food crisis, not due to the to climate change, but due to man-made interference with the free market. Let's take a look at this graph here, first of all. You can see what we've got for global wheat crop yield. Now, wheat is the biggie. That's mm -hmm. pretty much one of the things that is used in much of the Western world, although rice is big mm -hmm. in the uh, Eastern world. But look at the crop yields. They have consistently gone up over the past uh, oh, 40 or 50 years. And yep. there's two reasons for that. Number one, we've gotten better at agriculture on several fronts. We've produced better fertilizers. We've uh, produced better strains of the crop that are more uh, resistant to disease and drought and so forth. And we've come up with better farming practices to increase yields. Then there's also the fact that carbon dioxide increased in the atmosphere also increases yields. That's one of the things the left does not want to talk about. You know, they get all bent out of shape when you say, well, uh, you know, carbon dioxide is plant food. They try to play that down or just say out, outright say you're lying about it. But the fact of the matter is, is that photosynthesis, the process that creates plants, makes them grow and produces, you know, crops is based entirely upon CO2 intake. Increased CO2 intake increases yields. And that's the bottom line. And we've seen that all across the board for all kinds of different crops over the last 40, 50 years. Yes, there's other factors too, but we're not seeing any harm whatsoever from CO2. And that's the big thing. But here's one of the things that's really getting to be a problem right now. Now, everybody knows the gas prices are just off the scale, unprecedented. We've never seen them this bad. Well, that translates into uh, increased oil prices. Uh, we have Brent crude that spiked last week. We have other types of, of crude oil that have just hit record highs. Well, what people seem to forget or just don't know in the first place, and the left seems to be completely oblivious to this, that oil is the central factor for all kinds of different things, all kinds of mm -hmm. products. There's about 6,000 different products that you can identify that come from crude oil. You know, simple things like plastic. Here, we have a graphic here. That all these different things. I mean, you've got hair dryers and, and electric cords and sneakers <laughs> and toys and umbrellas and cameras and DVDs and CDs and tape. I mean, zip I, bags. Right? Yeah. It's you know, some the of the left, most... Oh, can, sorry, Andy. Yeah, the left doesn't think about this. But the biggest problem that we've got with food crisis and oil prices is the fact that fertilizer, much of the fertilizer used in the world, the, the manufactured fertilizer, not the kind of stuff you get out of cows and spread over the field or from chickens. I'm talking about the really good stuff, the stuff that's manufactured, the ammonium nitrate kind of stuff. That is produced from oil and oil processes. Yeah. And with the price of oil going through the roof, fertilizer prices are going to go through the roof. And that's going to mean 
some uh, farmers are going to cut back on fertilizer because they can't afford it based on what their market value of the crop is. Mm -hmm. That means yields are going to go down. And so, yeah, because of the prices that we've got on oil, there could be looming uh, food shortages, not because of climate change or global warming or any of those fantasy ideas, <laughs> but because the price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity, and it's creating a big um, market problem. Yeah, but, uh, Sterling, but, you go next. But uh, I just quickly wanted to point it out. And these goods are largely things that use, you know, that I personally use in my day to day life, like makeup and, and perfume. I mean, just things you always need. All right, Sterling, take it away. Well, uh, it's interesting that chart. Uh, probably the thing that we use the most uh, besides gasoline that, that I don't see on that chart, which surprised me, is I don't see a single cell phone there. I don't see a computer. Mm -hmm. But you know what? As far as I know, I, I've not seen anybody without a cell phone constantly in their hand. The plastics yeah. that, the, that those cell phones are housed in and the electronics that go into them all use oil or natural gas. Natural gas is also used for the fertilizer and the pesticides that are used right. on crops. Uh, yeah. Computers. I, I'm sitting here in front of a laptop that's got a plastic case <laughs> and that's made from oil and natural gas, folks. Uh, that odd is, is not on the chart, but, um, I would say, look, CO2 is plant food. Ask any, uh, greenhouse, you know, we, we call them greenhouse gases. It comes from the idea of a greenhouse, right? <laughs> well, greenhouse operators pump CO2 into their greenhouses precisely to grow plants faster and bigger. Yeah. Plants evolved at a time when CO2 levels were much higher than they are at present. 70% of the greening of the earth that we've experienced, including crop production, probably is attributable directly to uh, the increased CO2 in the atmosphere. Yep. <clears throat> we're setting records, not just, uh, you know, Anthony had the wheat chart. He could have shown the same chart for, for rice. He could have shown the same chart for corn. That's the other third major staple crop on yeah. earth. The cereal crops are the biggest, biggest thing. It make up they make up uh, I think around eighty percent of the diet of the world, mm -hmm. and all of them are up. All of them set records year over year, and it's largely due to the CO two. Now, um, I, I don't know if Anthony and I disagree on this, but where I will diverge a bit is the energy prices can um, lead to food shortages or at least food uh, price uh, difficulties, but there are problems around the world. And those problems, once again, aren't climate change induced, aren't from CO2, mm -hmm. aren't from warming weather, Gr better growing seasons are good for crops. Uh, a little bit more rain is good for crops, not bad, especially if uh, it's not an ear, you know, if you're not, if you, if you don't use large scale irrigation agriculture, like most developing countries don't have the infrastructure for, so they depend on rains. Um, but there are wars, there are conflicts, and those interfere sometimes with growing crops and sometimes with getting crops to the market, especially if rebels are stealing your crops uh, as you try and ship them. Look, the, the Ukraine has had an impact because a lot of wheat comes from, from, come from there, but uh, it's not a permanent impact. It is human cause, but it has nothing to do with climate change. Yeah, I mean, to go along with that, uh, like the Russia-Ukraine conflict has has impacted us. And I would largely say that's due to the increase of our reliance, the United States, on Russian uh, exports of, of crude oil, of oil in general. So while uh, when you when you consider that, like, sure, this this war is directly causing us to to have price increases and stuff. But the only reason this is happening is previous action Joe Biden took at the be beginning of his term which yeah. was to dismantle the energy independence the United States had gained and start relying on foreign interests. Now, I want to yeah. take a step back before uh, we advance here and bring this chart back up, because one of the common arguments you get from people is that, OK, well, the chart I showed was the entire world. But you could, you could argue that that's mostly the rich countries and stuff, while mm -hmm. poor countries, they're still struggling to actually grow basic crops. So I got two more charts here uh, to talk about this point. And here is the first one. So this chart shows the least developed countries. Uh, this is wheat again and the mm -hmm. crop yields that they have. So again, we can see since the 1960s to modern day, crop yields are increasing year after year with just minor noise and volatility along the way. 
and there's well, one, it's it, yeah. it's seasonal. Yeah, any farmer will tell you different. Yeah. Se- you know, one year it rains, one year it doesn't. We have better yeah. crops. But what's interesting about this chart you're showing, I can't see the details of it, but it looks to me mm-hmm. like a real spike in growth occurred around 2000. Yeah, records began to be set in least developed countries with regularity around 2000. And it's gone up much steeper for less developed countries than it has for the globe as a whole. It's worse than we thought. (laughs) It's worse than we thought. It's better for the poor. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, while I was doing research for this, I did see that uh, increases in prices for food, uh, just, I mean, this is common sense, but disproportionately uh, make the poor more food insecure in general. But Mm -hmm. going along with this chart, I actually have one more I'd like to show, which is... um, the low-income countries that already have food shortages, the crop yields for wheat in those countries. And again, there's 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 no arguing with this. It's just simply that as CO2 has risen over the last, uh, well, we'll say 60 years because it's the chart, crop yields are increasing across yeah. the board. There's, there's literally no way you can deny this data. Right. They'll try. But I want to point out, this is from the UN, which is a very, very left organization. Yeah. So this data is incontrovertible. Yeah, it's like when we cite the IPCC for a climate point. It's like if if the people that h- disagree with you generally support your position, it, it takes uh, some credence. But uh, OK, so I wanted to move forward and um, question or not question Sterling. I will give this question to you. Um, so climate alarmists, they are struggling to deny that that these increases in crop yields are happening across the, the globe. So they're pivoting to new arguments. One is that uh, climate change is causing an increase in extreme weather events. These extreme weather events are destroying entire crop harvests. And the other (laughs) is that um, the food in general or crops in general are becoming less nutritious. As they grow bigger, as they grow faster, they're losing the the nutrient density that that they previously had. And that lack of nutrient density is just as bad for for the world. My camera is spazzing out just as bad for the world uh, as a shortage in food in general. Sterling, what do you think about that? Wow, your camera really is bad. Yeah, I, uh, I'll full screen you while I continue to have my, my <laughs> seizure. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, um, they haven't pivoted to anything. They, 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 they ram these all the time. Uh, they, they run repeated, especially seasonal claims about different natural disasters uh, and then try and time to climate change. You know, we got one yesterday. Uh, they were hyping a, a report in Nature about allergies. Oh, allergies mm-hmm. are getting worse. Uh, okay, uh, they're they're not getting worse, but the allergy season's running longer. Okay, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I, I I don't dispute that. I, I actually take allergy medicine. Um, the question is, you know, what are we to do about it? And you'd think their answer would be, we must suppress crop production and we've got to stop the greening of the earth because you know what? The allergies are a response to increased pollen, which is good for pollinators, which is good for plants. Uh, Basically the expanded allergy season is the expanded growing season for crops and the expanded greening of the earth. So they take one drawback of the greening of the earth and make uh, climate change, the culprit, and say, "Oh, look how bad climate change is," and then they ignore sort of the larger picture. Yeah. Now, as far as the nutrients thing, I think there is, uh, you know, there, we can dispute <laughs> whether uh, nutrients are going down or becoming less dense. But mm-hmm. if I'm wrong, um. It's a small decline that I've seen, you know, where I've seen them claim that it's it's a decline. Uh, it's a small decline. And because people are getting more uh, caloric intake, because mm-hmm. food is becoming more abundant, they're more than making up for it. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> if, if you only have one grain of rice to eat and it's less nutritious, okay. But if because you now have five grains of rice, but they're a, each one is a little less nutritious than the previous one, the single one you had, you're mm-hmm. still getting more nutrition. Um, Agreed. So, uh, but but I'm not an agronomist and I'm not a botanist, so I haven't done the research on that. But my suspicion is that uh, we know calorie intake is up in developing countries. Yeah. Right. And we know they're doing better 
better on average than the rest of the world as far as the increase in growth. So they're benefiting, not yeah, losing. Yeah. On you could net. probably plot Weight Watcher in, uh, input. A number of people that have signed up to Weight Watchers to figure out how we're doing as far as food intake goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing uh, how popular Weight Watcher is in these core po uh, poor countries that people are starving. <laughs> it's exactly. just it's, it's core yeah. market. So well, I actually, like you say yeah. you you said this one thing and this is really important. They say these things again and again and again. It's Chicken Little all over mm -hmm. again, but it's Chicken Little from scientists, right? Yeah. Paul Ehrlich is a scientist, a popular scientist. He's been on TV hundreds of times, if not mm -hmm. thousands of times. He's written lots of big books. And as far as I can tell, he's made hundreds of predictions. Not a single one has ever come true. And yet he's still considered an expert. He yeah. said 200 million people would die in Africa in the 1970s from starvation. Yeah. They didn't. He said New York would already be underwater. It's not, That's but right. he keeps getting on. Uh, he gets keeps getting invited on TV to talk about his doomsday scenarios. So this isn't new. Climate alarmists, uh, environmental alarmists, have been making these claims for decades that mm -hmm. we're running out of resources, that we'll run out of oil, so we need to transition. That we'll have worsening weather, whether it's colder or warmer. Because remember, in the seventies, these same climate alarmists were saying the ice age was coming. Yeah. The 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 predictions are sometimes different, but the answer is always the same. Bigger government to control how people live. Yep, Could not that's agree absolutely more. Right. Um, I'm just going to read a few stats on the hunger thing, and then I want your uh, input on this, Linnea. But so as far as uh, world hunger grows or goes, 8.9% of the world's population is currently under undernourished. So they basically don't meet their basic caloric requirement. 663 million people, uh, so the 8.9% is 663 million people. 22% of children younger than five are stunted. So they're they're shorter than they should be. They're not as developed as they should be because they're not getting the caloric requirements that their body craves. 9% um, of the world's population is food insecure, severely food insecure, which essentially means you don't know where your next meal is coming from. You don't know where you're going to get your food from. And one in four people globally, which is 1.9 billion people, are at least moderately food insecure, which, again, means the, the confidence that you know where every meal is coming from is lacking. Linnea, if you're in a situation where you don't know what your next meal is and you can get some rice that has 8% zinc and then some rice that has 4% zinc, do you think it's worth, you know, telling people that the, the the explosion of crop yields across the globe is bad because we're losing just, you know, a little, little bit of the B vitamins, a little zinc, but you're getting food. Uh, yeah, no, that's, and that's the main point of that, right? Um, yeah. Would you rather have um, one ear of corn that has a like 30% daily value potassium quantity yeah. in it? Ooh. Or would you have 15 ears of corn that maybe each have, you know, 10% daily value of <laughs> potassium. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes a huge difference. So I don't think those people are, are concerned about this at all. But this is one of the scare tactics that the the environmental left and the, the green block will use is that, you know, they discount the idea that our fertilizers are getting better. They discount all this other stuff. They just yeah. say, well, CO2 makes plants bigger. And if they're taking in the same nutrients in the same soil as they were before, then they're not going to be as nutritious because the concentration of nutrient to water content isn't as good as it was yeah. before. So that's from what I've understood, that's the base argument there. Um, yeah, I, I, I do not think that that is concerning in the slightest, sorry, my Skype just went off for some reason. No um, I don't think that's concerning in the slightest to the average person who <laughs> is uh, trying to not starve to death. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah. but I, if I but can just see the marketing on this, you know, a, a box of fries now 10% less nutritious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. It's it's crazy. But, I mean, you have a few micrograms left of a certain nutrient. Yeah in it in a tomato or something and we're expected to 
get out the pearls and the fainting couches over it. We need to ban all well, fossil well, fuels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More important. Yeah. More importantly, we need to we need to get rid of the fossil fuels, and we need to uh, that make. <laughs> yeah, the fossil doubling, fuels. A, a doubling and a tripling of the crop itself uh, possible. And, you know, Linnea, when, when she was talking, she said, like, you know, a, a 30% to a 10%, two thirds drop. No, they're like she said later, it's micrograms. It's a half a percent decline yeah. in, yeah. Uh, you know, in, in zinc density, uh, a quarter percent decline in potassium density. We're talking really small uh, micro declines. But more importantly, you know, you, you cited all these figures. I, I don't yeah. know how trustworthy some of those are, like the one in four. Yeah. But uh, what's important to note is not just the absolute number of people who are hungry today, because they are. You know, there's there's hundreds of millions of people that are hungry today. But what direction the amount of hunger is going to. The, the steep decline <laughs> in hunger across the world in the mm -hmm. last 20 years. Two billion fewer people are hungry or malnourished than were 20 years ago. So mm -hmm. it's not just that, yeah, there are still far too many people who are hungry. That's true. But it's going in the right direction and it's going in the right direction pretty steeply. Yeah. Um, it, at this point, oh, go take it, Linnea. I want to make a comment on the comment that you just popped up on the screen. Yeah. Organic foods. One. It's, it's not that they are a necessarily a problem but the problem is the idea that an organic growing style that doesn't involve uh chemical fertilizers and doesn't involve gmos mm -hmm. is going to feed the number of people that we have today that we currently yeah. feed with modified foods uh it's just not possible unless you want to take up more way more land to do it yeah um i, I want to point out land. that G gmos are not just something recent. Every bit of food that we eat today is a GMO. Corn, for example, maize, when it originally started, and they, you know, uh, from the Incas, I believe, or maybe it was the Aztecs, one of the two, the, the mm -hmm. ears were like this big. They were little bitty things. And yeah. so through uh, selective breeding, fertilizers, all these other improvements that we've made, now we have ears. I can't even fit them on the screen. They're monster ears of corn. You get them at the 4th of July picnic. The point is, is that that's a genetically modified organism, but it's happened over a period of 150 to 200 years or more. Some of the new GMO stuff is happening over spaces of a few months. So what's the difference? When it gets into your gut, it's all the same. It breaks down into amino acids. I don't see the threat. Yeah, the, yeah, difference, I mean, the difference is um, crossbreeding takes generations and decades, um, whereas laboratory genetic modification mm -hmm. targets a particular characteristic that you want to highlight and can do it in a single generation or two generations. So yeah. if you want to produce rice that has more vitamin A, you can do that. Where mm -hmm. the problem is, is you've got the same environmentalists that want us to stop using fossil fuels. They also want to block the use of GMOs uh, because they say, oh, well, it's Franken food. You don't know what will happen uh, this could uh, they, they've de they've de delayed golden rice for more than a decade that could have been stopping people from young people, young children from going blind now. Yeah, right. Golden not rice, yeah. maybe developing cancer 100 years from now if they eat it every day in vast quantities for the rest of their lives. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Uh, you should be saving lives today. And we could do that with with more easier um, market availability of genetically modified organisms because it can done, be done so much more rapidly and target specific characteristics. So you don't get as many bad characteristics. I mean, crossbreeding produces, uh, we, we crossbreed dogs, right? We, we've crossbred dogs for centuries. Yeah. And it produces a weird range of dogs <laughs> from, the, from their wolf ancestor, right? The pugs can't even breathe. Yeah. <laughs> From the pugs and the teacup chihuahuas to the huh. uh, to the wolfhounds, <laughs> and um, none of which look very much like wolves, right? No, no. Um, but they also come from that from that breeding, different yeah. health problems. You know, yeah. uh, hip dysplasia is a real problem with a lot of working breeds. Uh, respiratory problems are, are real problems with pugs and bulldogs. 
that comes from crossbreeding. We, you mm-hmm. know, you get you get the little characteristics you like. Oh, they look good. They look the way we want them to. But it also carries uh, negative connotations. Genetic modification of crops. It, you know, it's funny. We get genetically modified medicines to the market quick. We need to get foods to the market just as quick to save lives today. Like you say, 680 million people are still uh, going hungry. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, you just sent me a link. Do you want me to put it on screen for you to talk about it? or? Yeah. You know, there um, there's, a, there's a couple of things out there. The American Kennel Club has been talking recently about climate change. I mean, it seems like every organization on the planet these days is somehow trying to get on the climate change bandwagon. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to point out that, you know, Mm -hmm. there's a couple of articles out there talking about climate change will affect your dog or your cat or your hamster or your fish or whatever it might be. I mean, you can just go look these up. You can type in any random search and come up with these kinds of things. But I want to point out that it's weather that is the main thing that affects, you know, things like dogs, their mood, just like it does us. Pretty much, you know, it's like this. Climate is a statistical construct. It's Mm -hmm. all about a bunch of numbers put together to come up with a value. Weather is what we experience on a day-to-day basis, not climate. Yeah, 100%, absolutely. Uh, I do want to move forward here, though. And Linnea, this question is also for you. Um, So we're 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 all in agreement. The global flu, uh, food supply is absolutely increasing. There's there's no denying it. But food prices have reached their highest levels in the last month since 2011. So if it's not due to climate change, um, can you can you give an explanation of why food prices are just inflating like crazy? Well, th- there's a whole lot of <laughs> stuff I know, going there, on with there's that. There's so many so- answers. <laughs> I, you know, on the one hand, um, some of it can be due to expected future shortages. Mm. Um, and obviously a lot of it has to do with the supply chain, uh, bottlenecks that we've had coming out of COVID. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the fuel costs are going to have an effect on that as we discussed earlier. Um, it's, it's, geopolitical rather than weather related for the most part yeah agreed i mean uh so are we know that there's a lack of uh people that actually want to enter the workforce in the united states right now and that's not because in the last year or two people just as a whole suddenly are like eh, i'm done working i'm just gonna gonna live welfare is cool no it's because we put policies in place that incentivize people not to work which is not the exactly what I'd like to incentivize, but that that's one of the causes of the supply chain issue. So I would tie the food prices, uh, the increase of them due to bad policy. Uh, well, actually, I'd tie it all to bad policy and then what results from it. So the oil and uh, in expensive fuel prices, that's due to losing energy independence in the United States. That's due to essentially doing whatever you can to make sure fossil fuel plants are shut down or at least not constructed. Um Then again, like transportation costs, it increases on so many levels. You've got uh, rules in place that incentivize people not to work. I mean, I I think you can tie a lot of this. They tie it to climate change. Climate change is helping. It's it's politicians and policy that are hurting. Yeah, it's look, they can't tie. They can't tie a single season spike in prices to climate ch- to global mm. climate change <laughs> that occurs over 30 years. They can't do that. Yeah. Uh, but they try. But they can. Oh, they that's can, for sure. No, I didn't say, I didn't say they won't try. <laughs> I said that logically and physically as a matter of physics, they can't tie it to that. Yeah. What they can, uh, what you can tie it to is, as you said, policies. Let's just look at one factor because there are multiple factors, but one factor. Okay, oil and gas prices. So the mm-hmm. gas, the oil, and by gas, I mean natural gas and gasoline, both. Yeah. Because those go in to uh, crop production. They're, they're mm-hmm. integral to it. All the tractors run on diesel. Yep. They're all lubricated by oil. They all, uh, the electricity prices, which have also gone up on farms as well as everywhere else. Yeah. D- rely on fossil fuels and other energy sources that are more expensive now. Um, the fertilizers, oil and natural gas. The pesticides, oil and natural gas. 
the storage facilities where these where crops once they're harvested remember you got to you got to plant them you got to fertilize them you got to uh, uh put pesticides on them. so you're constantly running these tractors so that price is going up mm-hmm. all this diesel diesel's going up faster than gasoline then the storage facilities have to to uh, use energy then the transportation has to use oil or gas uh uh you know whether it's trains or trucks or both mm-hmm. um Everywhere along the chain, the farm is one of the most energy intensive products out there. Absolutely. And so if if energy prices are spiking as they have, then your food prices are going to spike, too. Yeah, I mean, w- you, whatever else is happening, whatever else is happening, that has that effect. Yeah, it requires constant, you know, refrigeration. I mean, there's so many many steps that require energy, intensive amounts of energy along the way. So I, I absolutely think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I have one more question. And this one, um, Anthony, I'd, I'd like you to start, but we should all get an answer here. So um, there, there are politicians in the United States and there are people in the United States right now who are realizing that our uh, movement as a country away from fossil fuels, away from oil is finally hitting us. We're, we're actually feeling the effects of that. You have, you know, Senator Joe Manchin, who's actually coming out and saying, like, we, we need fossil fuels. You have Elon Musk tweeting that we need more oil and gas. Anthony, do you think that we that this this moment might actually spur some long term either action or shift in perceptions of the American people? Or is this just going to be another moment that the media tries to create a scapegoat for and then never talk about again? Well, I think that a lot of people right now, based on what I see on social media happening, yeah. they're just darned angry right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're angry with the, the situation with gas prices and food prices and everything else. And I think that's going to be reflected in the polls when we get to the midterms. And I think it's going to be a big whopping change for a lot of people. A lot of folks voted for what they believe was something righteous or better, you know, in the, in putting in Joe Biden and all of his stuff. But now they're realizing, hey, this wasn't such a good deal. Look what's happened to my ability to, you know, earn a living and to just pay the bills. I have had a couple of people on my Facebook feed talk about the fact that it's costing them so much more just to get to and from work each week that it's actually you know, cut their their wages, if they look at the numbers, something like 20%. I mean, that's just incredible. But that's what's yeah. happening with inflation out there and the cost of oil and gas and everything else. So I think, yeah, I think it's going to reflect in the way our political regime is, um, well, voted on when the, when the midterms comes up. And I think that it's a wake-up call for a lot of people who, you know, are thinking, well, you know, wind and solar are the future, electric cars are the future and so forth. But when the fact of the matter is they come down to it and they realize, wait, we're still dependent on these fossil fuels. We can't just pull the plug on it tomorrow. The entire world's economy is built around it. You can't just pull the plug on it. You can't jack the price up, you know, so much because it's going to cause things to go extinct. Some processes, producers, manufacturers, and so forth are just simply going to go out of business because they can't afford the energy anymore. And then when it shows up on the shelves, that's going to have an impact. Uh, Agreed. Sterling and Linnea, do either of you think that this might actually spur action or change in the United States, or are you more cynical on the whole issue? Um, I would hope so, but... uh... I'm, I'm usually the town cynic on this kind of thing. I think that I think that people have a relatively short memory when it comes to things in the news. Um, I've witnessed it in people close to me where if today on the news, it says we're having unprecedented rainfall. Yeah. And then the next day they say, oh, well, actually, we're having unprecedented drought. They can hold both opinions in their brain at the same time somehow <laughs> and think both of them are equally true all at once. So I think that uh, it would be it's worse than we thought. It's wet drought. Wet yeah. drought. <laughs> this drought is so bad. It's even, it's raining. Uh, wet drought. It's unprecedented. You, you, um, folks, you, you folks just don't understand that consistency is a hobgoblin of small minds. Uh, as Oscar <laughs> Wilde put it, right? Consistency right. is a sexually what, what, what dictated paradigm. What, what was it? It was, it's, it's Alice in Wonderland. The, the queen i've heard she said you know i've held uh, 
opposing views on things uh, 12 times before breakfast. Right? <laughs> or be yeah. Be believe diametrically opposed things 12 times before <laughs> breakfast. That's, that's climate people. Right. And, and that is, that's exactly climate people. You know, you can look at like 1984 is popular to mm -hmm. reference these days, tragically, oh, it's great. Uh, yeah. for a double think and all of that. So mm -hmm. it is, it, it's the same sort of idea. Um, I really hope that, you know, I know eventually people, the light bulb will go off in people's heads for this, but mm -hmm. I think it's going to take some pain at, you know, for your wallet and, you know, I, I think it's going to take people seeing, you know, rolling brownouts and stuff. Um, when yeah. that starts happening, I think Texas got a good wake up call last year yeah. with the freeze. It was really hard. And if you read a lot of the articles now, um, some of them that would traditionally be all in for the green energy stuff have been saying like, well, we probably should update our natural gas infrastructure yeah. <laughs> so we can make sure that when this happens again, it, it doesn't hit us this hard. Yeah. Um, so some people, yes, are absolutely learning. Um, mm -hmm. I am not going to hold my breath that the media at large is going to keep on topic here. Yeah. Well, first off, they have to get on topic before they can keep on topic. Yeah. As far as I can, as far as I can tell, so they still don't get it. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I, 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 I share Linnea's cynicism, I think. Sadly, mm -hmm. you know, Anthony and I are both old enough to remember the 70s. And <laughs> um, we uh, we went through a period called stagflation. First thing, first time ever. Well, guess what? Stagflation's back. Uh, we had a president called Carter who was running everything into the ground on energy, on energy. Mm -hmm. and, and And by the way, now he was a nuclear, he had a background in nuclear in the he nuclear Navy. Guy. So he knew nuclear. And he still uh, down downplayed it and and helped. Uh, yeah, remember when the, he put solar panels on the White House? And yeah, they, he, they he, basically were nothing more than than um, you know just bling. They didn't. That's do anything. what I'm saying. Is here's a guy who there? understood things. Sadly, I just think that uh, people in the day of mass media, uh, maybe common sense was more common before because they weren't people weren't commonly being assaulted daily. To, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, by the minute with news stories of disaster. And so people had a longer term point of view. They read yeah. the uh, farmer's almanac and took that seriously. And they said, Oh, well, farmer's almanac says this. Okay. Uh, now we're assaulted by the 24 hour news cycle. And I think that uh, I, I fear, I, I think it'll last through the next election, but maybe even the next two elections, maybe the presidential election. But the problem is uh, a new president will come in likely things will get better. Gas prices will go down. Oil prices go. People will forget because their memories are short term. They won't remember. Yep. The next generation of kids will be taught by public school teachers who are bought and paid for woke uh, advocates. Oh, yeah. And so they'll come up and start saying, how dare you and suing in court. And it will, it, it's, uh, it's sad. It's, it's, it's Nietzsche's uh, eternal recurrence. Uh, <laughs> yeah. People forget. People just forget. And they they deny physics because they don't understand physics. And and I think that whatever short term hard. gains we may yeah whatever short term gains we may make in the elections may mm -hmm. last for two or three election cycles. And I I fear, you know, the cynic in me says, sadly, we'll be where we are. And if it's not climate change, you know, if 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 the winters get colder regularly, if the sun has something to do with things, uh, as people think, some scientists think, and we go through an extended cooler period uh then we'll just have a different disaster that will drive yeah. ever larger call, calls for ever larger government and the best disasters are the ones that you can't see the ones that they can say are constantly there are existential yeah. and threaten life as we know it but you can't put your finger on it those are the disasters that hold real political value um i have one last comment on this before we close up and it's that I share uh, all your skepticism that this will lead to any long lasting change in the United States. But I do think that there's been a shift and it's not just from the oil prices right now, uh, a shift in perception of people related to trust of the media and the establishment. And in my opinion, the most beneficial part of the Trump presidency was that he woke a lot of Americans up to the fact that a the media is not our friend and b. Republicans and Democrats 
don't actually like hate each other. You would, whenever they both agree on something, that's when you should really be skeptical. But it, it, it caused a lot of Americans to kind of wake up, to open their eyes to, to the state of what's happening in the United States. Then, you know, we have Biden come in. And I do think that there are people that also will have a greater degree of skepticism in general when they're told things by the media or the government. And Biden uh, is like, renewables are great. I'm going to do the build back better. We'll move to, to all renewable energy. It'll work perfectly. Prices will go down and the earth will be clean. And then what we end up having is, you know, like incredibly the highest oil prices or gasoline prices of all time. We have shortages. We're seeing um, food prices, like everything that we've touched on this podcast. And I think that because of um, the shifts in perception and the 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 enlightening, the red pilling of people during the Trump presidency, they'll have a more nuanced view of what's going on in society right now. So sure, you're probably right. Maybe in a, a couple of election cycles, but in my opinion, you're not going to fix the issues with the United States through democracy, through through like elections, you know, year to year. You're going to fix it by causing people to actually question what they're told, and think about things at a deeper level. And I do think that what's happening right now is leading more Americans down that path. Well, you're more hopeful than me, because it yeah. seems to me that the red pilling is still going on. Remember, Trump lasted four years. Oh, yeah. Uh, everyone woke up, and yeah. then they quickly, three years later, forgot when the next election, the next presidential election came. I, yeah. I, I see, I see uh Fauci somehow is still a hero um yeah Fair look we've had we had more deaths under Biden single year first year in office from covid than under Trump after the uh the uh vaccines were available um mm -hmm. and yet uh, we're still pushing vaccine and, and testing um mm -hmm. I, I, sadly there's a segment of the population that is wedded to a vision of the world um, that doesn't care about reality. They have a vision of the world and it's, it's a lot less freedom, a lot more control by government because they believe they'll be in charge of the government and they know best. And yeah. they're not going to be unred pilled. Uh, or, or which red pilling is when they actually wake up. It's yeah. Okay. It's, they're it's not going to be woke. It's when you take the, they, pill they are woke. The they're hole. not going to be awoken, awakened. Yeah. Uh, and the, and another segment of the population doesn't trust anything that comes out. Uh, and I don't think, <laughs> I, I don't know that that's any better, you know, frankly, uh, not trusting anything, uh, and, and immediately jumping on the conspiracy bandwagon for everything. I think that's a very small, sadly, I think it's a very small, and I don't know if it's a growing segment of the population that has an open mind to evidence, that evidence is really what persuades them as opposed to ideology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the the question everything, don't believe anything, is probably the QAnon people. It's always a conspiracy. But we are out of time. Uh, it's been, I mean, we went 12 minutes over already. Thank you all for joining us this week of Climate Change Roundtable. We do these every Friday at noon, uh, every, a new topic every week. Uh, outside of that, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, like it, leave leave comments about how awesome we all are. Uh, if anyone actually listens to this part, <laughs> they're going to leave. They're going to leave comments just that they hate, you know, someone. But uh, okay, uh, that's it. Catch you all next week. <laughs>